let me start off by asking you, how many of you have really paused and admired the diversity of life that is around us? I mean, starting from the tiny, tiny microbes that you need a microscope to see them, to understand them, to giant sequoia trees that soar 150 meters, to the amazing cognitive ability of humans. All of this is life. And believe it or not, all of this has come into being because nature took small incremental steps to improve on a very basic design of life. This primordial life might have been very simple, but the probability that the chemicals that made it happen would come together and make life again has never happened again, as far as we know it. So I'm a cell biologist, and members of my community are engaged in trying to understand the inner workings, the inner machinery of cells, and what makes life tick. In order to do that, what we need to understand is how life has evolved from microscopic life to more complex forms such as you and me, and what are the changes that has taken place at the cellular level to make life address new challenges as and when they arose. So to understand this process, it's a little difficult if you just study a little bunch of organisms that are very similar. Because you see, the underlying molecular machinery is dictated by the DNA, and the thousands of genes that interact amongst themselves to make life possible, it's going to be kind of hard if everybody's kind of the same. So what if you could look at a very unusual organism, which does things differently? Maybe that will help us to fish out genes that are important and read out the ones that are not important. So in this context, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you a very unusual microorganism. It is a tiny little parasite that resides in the human gut. It is so very different from most organisms that we know that at one point, scientists thought that it had diverged very, very early during the course of evolution. So some of you may recall your doctor telling you that the source of your tummy trouble was a nasty bug called Giardia. Full name, Giardia lamblia, also known as Giardia intestinalis. So as you look at the cell, the first thing that might catch your attention is this incredible bilateral symmetry that the organism has. It's a single cell. What you might also notice is that multiple whip-like appendages come out of the cell. There are, in fact, eight such appendages. The scientific terms for these are flagella. So the organism has four different pairs of flagella. It uses these to swim about in the host gut and gather food. You know, the host gut is also filled with fluids and to avoid being swept down the intestine, what it also does is sometimes it will attach to the intestinal wall. And it does so with the help of a very neat little suction cap that's located on its ventral surface. That's also called the ventral disc. So when it wants to hang on there, it just uses its cup. When it wants to get off, it releases. So it's an sort of an engineering marvel, if you ask me. Okay. Also, as it's residing in the host gut, it also senses its own chemical environment. So if the external appearance of this organism seems enigmatic to you, let me take you on a tour of its innards. That's more interesting. So before I show you the difference or how it's special, I need to refresh your memory a little bit about basic eukaryotic cell biology. Don't worry, I won't take too long, all right? So in many ways, a eukaryotic cell is like a city, right? It's divided into compartments. 
because compartments allow a process to become more efficient. So you have the nucleus, which is the command and control center. Out in the cytoplasm, you have a lot of manufacturing activity going on, proteins being made. Now those proteins need to go to specific destinations within the cell, and they do so by tra traveling through the endoplasmic reticulum, which are like roadways, right? Along the roadways, there are sorting stations, known as the Golgi, where decisions are made, who goes where, do you go to the plasma membrane, where do things go? There's even a recycling center, the lysosome. And last but not the least, all this frantic activity is actually fueled by ATP, much of which is synthesized by the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses. So compared to all this complexity, the inner workings of GRDA are fairly simple. So GRDA does not have any Golgi, does not have any mitochondria. Even its lysosomes are very, very simple and tiny. But curiously, it has two nuclei, right? But even with this simple game plan, this organism is able to achieve a lot. So what caused, or what evolutionary pressures caused Giardia to switch from a more complex to a less complex format, we do not know yet. But what we do know is the organism is capable of a very complex life. It handles the same challenges that you and I do. It has to go find food, find a way to take in the food, derive energy from the food, and last but not the least, respond to changes in its environment, right? So one of the reasons that this very simple form might have evolved is because GRDS genome is tiny. It's about 250 times smaller compared to yours and mine. But even with this tiny genome, what it's able to do is amazing. It is able to have two distinct forms. One is the trophozoid form, where I have shown you already, it has the flagella, and the other is the cyst form, which does not have the flagella. So if you can look at the two, they're very different morphologically. So these two different morphological forms are supported by that same tiny genome. One of the forms, as you can see, has flagella, and each of the flagella that I told you already, each flagella pair is capable of independent movement, very specific types of movement. So a small genome getting a lot done, right? So how does GRDA do this? How does it get more bang for the buck? That's what we would like to understand. So if you think about it, what are the things that do it? So actually, a small genome is not a bad thing to have. Think of the GRDA genome in terms of a startup, right? Limited resources, not many people, but very little regulation. That's what GRDA genome is. There's not much regulation. Compared to that, a cell in a multicellular organism has to talk to multiple cells, not only multiple cells, multiple different kinds of cells, and therefore has to adhere to many more regulatory networks, okay? So small genome is helpful. If also it has proteins that multitask. So this is where you can see the parallels with our lives emerge. A small, organi small organization is more efficient. If you can multitask, you're more efficient. What do I mean by multitasking? See, our research indicates that GRDA proteins can do more than the same proteins do in other organisms. So they'll do an additional function on top of the one that they are also meant to do. So I call these moonlighting functions. So this is GRDA teaching us how to do more with less, how to engineer life with much less resources. So if you are a budding synthetic biologist, then what you could learn from Giardia is how to engineer a new and different life form with a small genome. 
I mean, synthetic biology is no longer the stuff of sci-fi, right? It's almost going to be reality. No matter what people say that you can't play God, we do have the tools to do it. We just need to refine things a little more. Giardio also tells us how evolution can proceed along different paths. I mean, I've already told you that Giardia is so different that people thought that it had diverged away from the main line of eukaryotic evolution long ago. But there is a, what does this really mean? Let me tell you that. See, what it means in plain speak is that our ancestor and Giardia's ancestor, the last common ancestor that we shared, was very, very simple cell. Why was it a very simple cell? Because present G Giardia lacks mitochondria. So therefore, that ancestor must not have had mitochondria. Mitochondria emerged later on. But there's another school of thought that says that that last common ancestor did have mitochondria. But what happened was, during the course of evolution, Giardia somehow got rid of mitochondria. Now, why would it do that, right? See, you and I, the, uh, any biology textbook will tell you that mitochondria are important for ATP production. Sure, they are. But they are not the only avenue of ATP production. ATP can be also made without mitochondria. It's just that mitochondria do it much more efficiently, which is why most organisms have mitochondria. But think of a situation. If you are in an environment where food is plentiful, you don't have to worry about food. Why do you care about efficiency, right? That's what the environment Giardia is in. It's in the host gut. Anytime you eat, most of the food you eat goes to Giardia. It's happy siphoning away your hard-earned food, right? And in that case, it really does not care about efficiency of energy production. So it has lost, completely lost mitochondria, right? So this is one organism that is teaching us how to survive without mitochondria. So what we say is Giardia has undergone reductive evolution. It's like evolution in reverse gear. Most of us think that as evolution proceeded, things got more and more and more complex. Not with Giardia. As evolution proceeded, Giardia made things simpler and simpler and simpler. So does this teach us something? Does change always have to lead to a more complex solution? Not really. Sometimes the solution could be even simpler, right? Giardia also has a lot to offer to a student of biomechanics. See, Giardia swims around with four pairs of hands and feet. I mean, we have two pairs of hands and feet. Anybody who's learned swimming knows how difficult it is to coordinate them initially. It does so with four pairs. And each of the four pairs have different movement. So these genes in Giardia control four different movement types. It has the ability to swim very fast. It has the ability to slow down, forage for food. All of this with a tiny genome. Once again, keep in mind its genome is very small. So a student of biomechanics could not only learn the biology behind such different movements, they could also try and understand the physics behind that propulsion. Again, Giardia has a lot to offer. Also, let's take one step forward and, and sort of think of things in the realm of uh, sci-fi again. Can we make microbots with Giardia? These are just 15 micron long cells. Can we make microbots that swim around, that we can introduce into the enteric gut of the host and see what is going on inside? We can engineer it to gather chemical information. We can engineer it to detoxify the environment, right? So there's a lot you can do. You can engineer it so that it goes and sticks to the host gut wall, like Giardia does. Then you can flick a molecular switch, and it will detach itself from the host gut wall, pass right out 
without causing any harm to the host whatsoever. My own research, I'll tell you a little bit about it, is geared towards understanding what are the differences between Giardia cell biology and the human cell biology, so that we can find Achilles heels in Giardia to target and kill it. See, this human pathogen causes a lot of issues. Much of that is not appreciated, mostly because it does not kill. But in India, it's a major problem, as it is in any tropical country. In India, unsafe drinking water and also the lack of uh, and the uh, poor sanitation contribute to the two major risk factors that cause death of children between the ages of 5 and 14. India has the highest death rate linked to diarrheal disease of any of the BRICS nation. Right? So we need to find a way to solve these problems. And we have to find a cure for these. Because 20% of the GRDL cases actually become chronic. So you may suffer from gut infection for a long, long time. That's because whatever, even if you take metronidazole, which is the most widely available GRDL drug, it's not going to be able to cure it because GRDL, your GRDL strain has become drug resistant. Right? Not only is, so there are people who argue that, well, enteric diseases are really not that much of a problem because most cases they are self-limiting and you don't die. Sure, I will agree with that. But what people miss out is in certain cases, these enteric diseases cause cryptic morbidity that we miss very easily. What do I mean by that? See, a child who gets repeated bouts of diarrhea as a, uh, within the first five years of life has impaired brain development because that child is suffering from malnutrition. Even the immune system of the child gets compromised. Such children cannot, cannot live up to their full potential in life. And therefore, we need to combat enteric diseases. We need to combat Giardia because we owe it to our future generations. And I hope someone out here will see all the beauty of this organism and look at it in a new light and take it up. Thank you.